Hello, knowledge seekers. In this episode of 20 Minute Books, we explore the revolutionary work, The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. This groundbreaking book offers a new approach to business that's being adopted around the world. Ries's methodology, based on lean manufacturing and agile development concepts, is about constantly testing, adapting, and adjusting before it's too late. The Lean Startup isn't just about how to create a successful business. It's about how to manage innovation. It tells us that planning and forecasting are all very well, but without continuous testing and feedback, businesses are more likely to go bust than boom. It encourages entrepreneurship and helps you create a business that is sustainable, flexible, and perpetually ready to adapt. Author Eric Ries is an accomplished entrepreneur who co-founded IMVU, a social network platform based on 3D avatars making him a key player in the tech industry. His vast experience and success have made him a sought-after consultant and speaker across the globe. The Lean Startup is the quintessential guide for anyone dreaming of founding their own company or those already on their entrepreneurship journey. It is particularly beneficial for those in tech companies where the rate of progress is fast and failure can be costly. If you are interested in swift product development, efficient testing, and creating a robust business model, this book will be your beacon. Join us in this episode as we delve into the insights and wisdom of The Lean Startup, a book that has forever changed the world of startups and tech enterprises. The Lean Startup How Constant Innovation Creates Radically Successful Businesses Introduction The Unique Landscape of Managing a Startup Stepping into the innovative terrain of startups, the very first thing you'll learn is the pivotal objective you, as a startup, should set your sights on. Management, in its traditional sense, can be broken down into two key parts, devising strategic plans, and supervising the team that puts them into action. Here's the usual formula. A manager formulates a plan, sets specific milestones, and delegates tasks to the team, providing direction and ensuring those crucial milestones are hit promptly. This method of management works beautifully in seasoned organizations, those that have a robust historical backdrop, a tangible track record of what was successful and can therefore provide guidance for future endeavors. But startups dance to a different tune. They don't have the luxury of a historical past to lean on. They're often in the dark about customer preferences, and they are grappling with finding the most effective ways to reach potential customers and build a solid business. So, their path towards what might work demands them to remain adaptable. Clinging on to inflexible strategies set in stone milestones or long-term market predictions is tantamount to self-deception. Nonetheless, a surprising number of founders still reach for the standard corporate management toolbox, wielding milestone plans and long-term market predictions. It's akin to preparing a spacecraft for launch, finessing it for years, only launching when it's primed to perfection. But the reality is this. Running a startup is like navigating a jeep across uneven, ever-changing terrain. Founders need to be prepared to quickly swerve and alter course in response to sudden obstacles and unexpected dead ends. However, it's critical for startups not to fall into the trap of completely ditching planning in favor of adopting a haphazard, just-wing-it attitude. Navigating aimlessly is sure to get you lost. A steady hand is needed at the helm, someone capable of making judicious decisions about the course to follow. A startup management team's responsibility, then, is to maintain a bird's-eye view of their situation, continuously steering their venture towards its overarching objective. Therefore, it is paramount for them to identify the correct metrics to ascertain whether their journey is moving them in the right direction. In summary, Managing a startup is a whole different ballgame compared to steering an established company. Part 1. The Primary Mission of a Startup Uncovering a Lasting Business Model The heart and soul of any startup, its raison d'etre, 
is to unearth a business model that's both profitable and capable of standing the test of time. No matter how convoluted and intricate your milestone plans may be, regardless of how flawlessly they're executed, and even if you have the media hanging on your every word, none of this matters without a sustainable business model. To ensure that your venture isn't destined to be a fleeting endeavor, destined to fizzle out into obscurity, you must carve a path to acquiring customers and generating revenue by catering to their needs. Let's say your big idea is to offer online instructions for knitting kilts. You need to probe. Is there a real demand for such instructions? Can you monetize them? If the answer to both is a resounding no, it's time to pivot. Seek out something else that people crave and are ready to part with their money for. So the alpha and omega of your startup should be the quest for a sustainable business model, one that works not just today, but promises to be resilient in the days to come. In real-world terms, this equates to discovering what your prospective customers desire and figuring out how to convert those desires into a reliable revenue stream. The primary duty of any startup's management should be to laser focus the entire organization, including the day-to-day operations, on accomplishing this paramount goal. The quicker a startup can find its footing with a sustainable business model, the better its chances of success. In a nutshell, the core mission of a startup is to uncover a lasting business model. Part two, uncovering a sustainable business model through the lens of validated learning. To unearth a sustainable business model, startups need to accomplish two key things. Understand what their customers desire and determine how to monetize it. They need to zero in on the right product for the right audience and learn the ropes of selling it effectively. This doesn't necessarily entail crafting a perfect plan right out of the gate. Instead, it's a journey of perpetual learning, preferably validated learning. This means assimilating knowledge through a systematic, science-backed approach. Embarking on the journey of validated learning entails framing hypotheses around the potential success of certain products within a specific market. For instance, you might hypothesize, American customers will be open to buying shoes online. These core hypotheses need to be put to the test. And only if they stand validated after interacting with customers can a startup be confident that they're on the right path towards discovering a sustainable business model. Resist the urge to use questionnaires or hypothetical customer scenarios. Instead, engage with actual customers in an authentic environment. The surefire way to ascertain whether people are willing to purchase your product is to put it out there and gauge their reaction. Consider the exemplary story of Zappos. It started with the straightforward hypothesis that customers would be open to purchasing shoes online. To validate this idea, they photographed shoes in physical stores and featured them on a make-believe online shop. When customers actually attempted to purchase shoes from the online platform, Zappos had the validation they needed. Thanks to this approach, the blueprint for one of the most successful business models in recent years was born. In conclusion, the path to discovering a sustainable business model is paved with validated learning. Part three, the daring dive into uncertainty, assessing your value and growth assumptions. The journey of shaping a product is often a leap of faith. As a founder, you invest your faith in the future prosperity of the product you're keen on bringing to life, even when there's no concrete evidence to back it up yet. To bridge the chasm between conviction and knowledge swiftly, every founder should articulate and test two critical assumptions. Firstly, the value hypothesis proposes that a product will provide value to its customers, meaning early adopters will identify and embrace the product. Secondly, the growth hypothesis asserts that the product won't just resonate with a narrow group of early adopters, but will also infiltrate a wider market eventually. It's crucial to put these assumptions under the microscope at the earliest possible stage. Only if they hold water should you consider devoting time and energy towards product development. Take Facebook, for example. They managed to validate both their value and growth hypotheses during the nascent stages when the social network had just a handful of users. For starters, the registered users were highly active on the platform, 
Over half of them were logging in at least once daily, a robust validation of the value hypothesis. Further, Facebook demonstrated phenomenal user activation rates, implying rapid market penetration. In colleges where Facebook had been launched, a staggering three-quarters of all students registered within a month, without the company having to shell out a dime on marketing. This served as a powerful validation of the growth hypothesis. This compelling data turned investors into ardent believers in the future triumph of this emerging social network leading them to pump in millions at an incredibly early stage. In summary, when taking the daring dive into uncertainty, make sure to assess your value and growth hypotheses. Part four, crafting a minimal viable product to test market your idea. One mistake that many founders make is investing too much time in perfecting a product in solitude, not knowing if there's a genuine customer base awaiting it. If the aim is to establish a sustainable business, it's vital to ascertain if your product has a potential demand at the earliest. The fastest and most efficient way to glean real-world customer feedback is by developing a scaled-down version of your product. This minimal viable product, MVP, should be stripped down to its bare essentials, just enough to offer customers a true sense of how your product functions and to elicit valuable feedback from them. Your MVP could be a basic, skeleton-like prototype of your product, or even just a smokescreen, a guise of selling a fictitious product. A perfect example of this approach is displaying shoe images on an online store, despite not having any actual shoes to sell. Consider the case of Dropbox's founders. They were aware that bringing their idea to life would be a time-intensive task so they chose a clever and straightforward method to validate their hypothesis. That there was a market for a new, user-friendly, data-syncing service. They made a video demonstrating their concept. The founders had hypothesized that there would be a demand for such a product, and they hit the nail on the head. Within just a single night, 75,000 individuals had signed up for their waiting list solidifying Dropbox's team belief that they were on the right path. Consequently, they commenced the actual product development with heightened confidence. Likewise, every startup should first validate the demand for their product before diving headfirst into its development. So, the secret is crafting a minimal viable product to test market your idea. Part 5. The Cycle of Building, Measuring, and Learning Swift and repeated iterations are key. When hunting for a sustainable business model, learning takes center stage. Every startup needs to learn what products to build and how to monetize them effectively. However, this learning cannot happen in a vacuum. It requires interaction with the real world, unveiling your product to customers, accruing their feedback, and gaining valuable insights from it. To streamline this process, Establish what's known as BML or Build, Measure, Learn loops. Firstly, you build a rudimentary version of your product, whether a prototype or a smoke test. Secondly, you introduce this product to its intended market and gather customer feedback. By amassing quantitative data from this field test, you measure the level of interest in your product. For instance, you might monitor how many visitors clicked on the buy button to purchase shoes from your mock online store. In the measuring phase, don't just focus on the hard numbers. Make it a point to converse with your customers. To truly understand your data, you need to grasp the unique impressions and opinions of your customers. The insights gleaned from each cycle should then serve as the blueprint for crafting a new, improved version of your product, propelling you into the next BML cycle. This process is iterated until you discover a sustainable business model. Speed is of the essence in these iterations. Each BML loop sharpens your product and gifts you precious insights into your customers' desires. The more loops you complete, the closer you edge towards discovering your sustainable business model. In essence, the mantra is build, measure, learn, swiftly and as many times as possible. Part six, optimize your product with the aid of split testing. In the realm of product development and enhancement, startups need to differentiate between what's valuable and what's wasteful. 
They need to identify which features contribute value to their customers and which don't. Value-adding features are those that lure in more customers or escalate the company's revenues. Conversely, features that don't contribute to either goal are deemed wasteful, even if the founders or engineers consider them to be revolutionary. A clever technique to sift the valuable from the wasteful is split testing. Each time you contemplate adding or modifying a feature, create two renditions of your product, one with the new feature and another without it. By testing both versions, you'll promptly identify which one garners more customer appeal. The pioneers of this methodology were mail order companies. For instance, to ascertain if a new catalog layout would boost orders, they printed two variants. Half their customers received the conventional design while the other half got the new one. Other than the layout, the catalogs were identical and customers were randomly assigned, meaning the company merely had to compare the volume of orders each group placed. This data unraveled whether the new design was an upgrade or a downgrade. Drawing from this, any startup can pre-test every proposed change before actual implementation. Curious if your website would perform better in red than in blue. Why not forge two test versions and monitor customer click rates over a few days? Every alteration you consider for your product should undergo this quasi-scientific testing process prior to implementation. So, adopt split tests to optimize your product. Part 7. Pivoting is often essential to discover the right business model for your company. A common myth in startup circles is that sheer perseverance and an unyielding resolve are the formula for a successful company. According to this narrative, a resolute founder conceives a brilliant idea and overcomes a myriad of obstacles until the idea eventually blossoms into a sensation. However, this mindset often lands startups in what's known as the land of the living dead. These are the startups that, much like oblivious zombies, ignore obvious signs and keep pushing to sell a product that the market simply doesn't desire. To evade this pitfall, you should continually ponder what alterations to your product might boost its appeal and help it find its target market. In addition, you should intermittently consider if a pivot is warranted, a significant course correction. A pivot can manifest in various forms, such as redefining the fundamental value of your product, deciding to target a different customer segment, or switching your primary sales channel. The defining characteristic of a pivot is the shift in the core assumptions underpinning the startup, which necessitates testing new hypotheses. Deciding to pivot can be a difficult decision, and consequently, startups often delay and dodge making this pivotal choice. This is why scheduling monthly pivot meetings can be advantageous. In these meetings, you critically evaluate the collected data and ask yourself if your startup is veering towards zombie territory and in need of a pivot. Several startups had to pivot multiple times before they blossomed into successful enterprises. Look at Groupon, for instance. It originated as a platform for activism and fundraising, only later metamorphosing into the Daily Deals platform it is known for today. Therefore, pivoting is frequently crucial to pinpoint the optimal business model for your company. Part 8. In the early stages, every startup should concentrate on one growth engine. At the heart of every business model lies a growth engine, a crucial component that ensures the company doesn't reach a standstill. There are three distinct types of growth engines. The sticky engine relies on retaining existing customers who already furnish a regular revenue flow. The emphasis isn't on courting new customers by investing in marketing. Instead, it's on persuading current customers to use the product more frequently by introducing new features or offering superior service. The viral engine operates by leveraging existing customers to perform the company's marketing. Product awareness propagates among your target customers through word of mouth. This can drastically cut down your marketing expenses, so it's advantageous to make it as straightforward as possible for customers to participate in this kind of viral marketing. A classic example of a viral growth engine is Hotmail's automatic email signature. P.S. Get your free email at Hotmail. Lastly, a paid engine functions by investing in marketing, 
such as paid online advertisements. Of course, this is only sustainable if current customers generate sufficient revenue to ensure the user acquisition cost remains lower than the user lifetime value. While it's possible to utilize all three growth engines simultaneously, it's often sensible to concentrate on just one initially to rapidly build momentum. Focusing on one growth engine also simplifies the evaluation of new features. If they accelerate the growth engine, they're valuable. If they don't, they're wasteful. So in the beginning, every startup should concentrate on a single growth engine. Part nine. While vanity metrics may seem appealing, they're often deceptive and won't assist you in establishing a sustainable business model. Discovering a sustainable business model isn't possible for any startup without occasional pauses to seek guidance. And this guidance stems from scrutinizing the appropriate metrics. To assess whether you've made strides towards your long-term objectives, you must analyze the data you've accumulated. Regrettably, many startups succumb to the allure of vanity metrics. They may be flattering, but are generally useless or even detrimental metrics that make a company appear successful without aiding in reaching its goals. Startups that depend on vanity metrics are essentially glancing into a business version of a slimming mirror, which obscures genuine issues and hampers their resolution. For instance, receiving ample media coverage and accruing Facebook followers might be flattering, but it's crucial not to misconstrue these indicators as markers of success. They don't contribute to the bottom line, and you shouldn't squander your energy attempting to influence such insignificant metrics. Other vanity metrics might include the number of hours you've dedicated to a product or the milestones you've achieved. These figures may or may not correlate with your startup's success, so the objective should never be to maximize them. Even if someone is clocking in 100 hour work weeks, it's entirely feasible that those hours are being wasted on endeavors that bear no relevance to long term success. For a startup to be successful, it must discover a sustainable business model and develop a customer base that uses its product, neither of which can be achieved if you're preoccupied with the wrong metrics. So while vanity metrics may seem appealing, they're often deceptive and won't assist you in establishing a sustainable business model. Part 10. Each startup must identify its key metrics and scrutinize them thoroughly. Identifying the appropriate metrics to monitor and consistently assessing them is crucial for every startup. You'll only be certain you're progressing towards your long-term objective of creating a sustainable business model. If you witness improvement in these metrics, the appropriate key metrics will vary from startup to startup, but they frequently involve things like growth in the number of paying customers, average session duration per customer, and the number of referrals generated per thousand customers, for instance. Each startup must discover its own set of key metrics to provide direction and a realistic gauge of its progress. When analyzing data, the cohort analysis method can be beneficial. Instead of merely observing how revenues or the user base have generally grown, you should compare the behavior of new customers with that of older ones. Suppose one of your key metrics is your referral rate. To comprehend its development, you should consider the following. How often, on average, did customers who signed up six months ago recommend your product to their friends? What about customers who registered four months ago or two months ago? By comparing cohorts, in this case, groups of users who signed up at different times and their respective referral rates, you can discern whether you're making headway towards your objective. You're only progressing if the metric is improving. If it's not, you're at a standstill. So each startup must identify its key metrics and scrutinize them thoroughly. Final summary. The essential takeaway from this book, startups must adopt a quasi-scientific approach to scrutinize their primary assumptions and then construct a sustainable business model grounded on confirmed hypotheses. They ought to promptly develop product prototypes and continually refine them by accumulating customer feedback and cycling through build, measure, learn loops. This book answers the following queries. What should be a startup's primary goal and how should it be achieved? 
The management of startups requires a different approach than that used for established companies. The objective of a startup is to identify a sustainable business model. Validate your learning to find your sustainable business model. How can startups identify the right product and business model? Leap of faith assumptions. Validate your value and growth hypotheses. Create a minimal viable product to test your idea in the market. Engage in rapid, repetitive cycles of building, measuring, and learning. In order to identify the right business model for your company, you typically need to pivot. How can startups find their growth engine and accurately analyze the correct metrics? In the initial stages, every startup should concentrate on one growth engine. Though they may seem flattering, vanity metrics can often be misleading and will not help you establish a sustainable business model. Every startup must identify its key metrics and scrutinize them thoroughly. Thank you for joining me today on this journey of learning and discovery as we explored the insights of another thought-provoking book in our growing library of knowledge. If you've enjoyed our time together, please take a moment to follow our podcast, give us a five-star rating, and share 20-minute books with other knowledge seekers. Your support truly means a lot. Don't forget to join me again in the next episode, where we will delve into another enriching book. Until then, happy reading and happy listening.